Hello, everyone. I'm Julia Chatillo, the Conference Programming Manager for South by Southwest EDU. We're so excited to have you join us for the next session of South by Southwest EDU online. Today, we have the wonderful opportunity to bring you a conversation on border crossing and sacred stories. This powerful discussion among authors will explore ancestral stories, legendary heroes, and epic histories in a reflection of borders and cultures in their work. Now, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Rose Brock and authors David Bowles, Darcy Little Badger, and Daniel Nayeri for this incredible conversation. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Rose Brock, a professor in the Library Science and Technology Department in the College of Education at Sam Houston State University. And it's my honor to moderate this panel, Border Crossings and Sacred Stories. As an educator, I know that the very best books for young people build community by breaking down boundaries and redefining the notion of borders. That's the superpower of storytelling. Today, we'll be discussing the intersection of borders between the living and the dead, borders between countries, between people, between narrative structures, and sometimes even magic. Welcome, Darcy, David, and Daniel to this panel. I'd like to begin today by asking each of you to introduce yourselves and tell us um, a little bit more about your soon to be released book. So Darcy, if you wanna jump in first, that'd be great. Sure thing. I am Darcy Little Badger. I am a Lipon Apache scientist and storyteller. And my debut novel, Alatsue, is coming this August 2020 from Levine Credo, yay. It's a, a novel, a young adult novel about a Lipon teen who investigates the murder of her cousin in this really creepy South Texas town. Um, and it does kind of combine ancestral knowledge with magics, with even elements of stories that I uh, heard growing up. Thank you so much. Uh, Daniel. Hi, uh, my name is Daniel Nayeri. I am the, well, I'm an <clears throat> editor and author. I, I've written this book here. It's a autobiographical middle grade novel called Everything Sad is Untrue. And it, it follows the story of really four generations in my family, um, but more specifically, uh, with the narrator myself and as a as a young kid who uh, traveled my my mother um converted to christianity we were it lived in iran um it's a capital crime and became refugees when she got a fatwa on her head and so um my father chose to stay my mother my sister and i uh went uh, for about three years in different um refugee camps uh in the uae and then in italy until finally getting asylum to Oklahoma, uh, where the story sort of begins and the kid is standing in front of a classroom of very, very uh, dubious uh, classmates trying to explain what, what had just happened, the life um, that he, he sort of left behind, the father he left behind, but also the stories, um, the mythology, the legends, and the history of Iran. And, um, you know, none of it is believed. He's sort of the, the poor kid in the back of the class. And so um, it sort of cuts back and forth between the classroom um, and, and the, the sort of the journey to, to America and, and, and goes all the way back generations into sort of the land of where, right where family history starts to blend into to mythology. Um, and that, that's the story. Thank you so much. David, would you um, please introduce yourself and tell us um, more about your book? Sure. Um, hey guys, I'm David Bowles. I'm a Mexican-American author from the borderlands of deep South Texas. And here I also teach um, literature and novel to the, the, the Aztec language at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. Um, the other work that I do in addition to writing and teaching is translating. I'd love to translate from, from Spanish into English, from English into Spanish, from Nahuatl into English, but back and forth among those three languages. And um, for Levin Querido, I have translated the really, really fa this fabulous book by Maria Garcia Esperon, a, a wonderful Mexican author um, that is called in English, The Sea Ringed World, uh, Sacred Stories of the Americas. And in her original collection, uh, Maria brought together sacred stories from you know, North and South America, um, retold them in, in a fresh, really accessible way, a very poetic way um, that both preserves um, and respects the original 
intent of the, the, of the stories and storytellers within those traditions, but also makes them accessible to people outside of those traditions. And in translating that, that collection into English, um, I've also added a couple of additional sacred stories um, to kind of round out a few thematic things that we saw in it. And I'm just really excited for people to, to, to have access to um, this really fantastic collection that hopefully will serve as a stepping stone into people's further um, understanding of indigenous traditions and sacred stories. Thank you so much. I'm excited about it too. Um, I thought we would start um, with just some questions for everyone. And then I do have some questions for you individually, but I, you know, in, in thinking about um, the tradition of storytelling, it got me to thinking about and questioning for each of you. I'm curious, and we don't have to go in any particular order, um, but I'm curious and I'd love to hear more about, you know, like when and where you were first introduced to storytelling. If you'll give us some background about that, I would love to hear more about that. Yeah, I've got to say, I probably was introduced before I could remember uh, <laughs> like, as a child. It's just something that always my parents, uh, especially my mother, has provided with me these stories. And they, they really informed my childhood growing up. And I, I credit a, a lot of my writing career today to just that background of having parents who just exposed me to so, so many beautiful stories when I was a child. Um, and a lot of it was oral storytelling. Of course, I did also get picture books read to me, but my mother would tell me stories, slip on stories that you can't find in books. Um, Thank you. Um, yeah, where I was introduced to it, I, you know, I, you know, we we also sort of had a, we had a family where my father quoted a lot of poetry. Um, just by by nature of our travel we didn't we didn't have a lot of books but there was there was this the time i sort of credit for the moment where i was like oh storyteller you know that that sort of like the storyteller that that place in the sort of you know whatever in the community that is such an interesting um position was this there was this guy who lived on on the land my grandfather in adistan it opened the story begins with really the first memory the only memory of him in this uh, place in Ardestan, it's sort of a rural part of Iran. And there was a guy who sort of lived out on the outskirts of the village with his wife. And, um, and they, didn't, they didn't have children, but they loved children. And so he um, it would take uh, the sort of metal scraps uh, of uh, just like, just whatever, sheet metal, parts of cars, stuff like that. And he would build like sort of toy-like things. Don't imagine like Barnum and Bailey, imagine like, <laughs> like a scrap yard, um, but he built a Ferris wheel. It was the first time I'd ever seen a Ferris wheel. And um, again, not Paris. Uh, and so, uh, you know, and we would go out there and at the, 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 the sort of experience, I was the youngest of the kids, was always sort of capped by everyone running to him and asking for a story. And, um, and he would tell, yeah, these sort of versions of fairy tales that I now realize are sort of from the North Caucasus um and we would just sit there under a blanket and listen um and that was that was the first time i was i i wanted to i i that was the first time i came across like charisma right like just here is a person just uh um commanding uh, the attention of all these kids telling these sort of fairy tales and and that uh that was the first time i think i came across it. and in my case yeah, in my case, it was, you know, every family has a storyteller. Um, in my family, it was my grandmother, Garza. Um, and she, I mean, my, my aunts and uncles and my, and my dad, they were all great storytellers as well. But, but she was like the person whom they had learned from, right? And so she would regale us with these stories, especially when she got um, my cousins and me. And we're mostly all boys. I have like one female cousin, Christy Pettis, and all the rest of them are boys. And, um, I remember uh, we would sometimes get dropped off at her house on a Saturday afternoon in the summer, and we were a rambunctious bunch, a bunch running around, chasing her chickens, throwing dirt clods at each other. And so she would call us in and <laughs> sit us down and give us a little, you know, a little cookie or pastry, something she had baked and some aguas frescas. And she would sit in her rocking chair and tell us stories. And they were, you know, these old um, border folk tales that were deeply rooted in like Spanish 
colonial Mexico, but those stories were also rooted in pre-Columbian Mesoamerica. So you had all these really interesting indigenous threads that later in life, I would begin to pull out to, to find the underpinnings of my family stories. Um, and she just had us in rapt attention. We just like leaning and hanging on every word. And she told us the scariest stories she could because we we're boys and we wanted gross, scary stuff as we wanted to hear. So we heard stories of like La Llorona, Las Lechuzas, which are like witches that transform into owls and steal children away, or La Mano Pachona, which is this disembodied claw that um, hides in the darkness and jumps out to strangle people. And, and we loved every moment of it. It was definitely the kind of thing that got me interested in reading. I was always asking her questions and wanting to know more stories until she got to the point that she told me, se me acabaron los cuentos, my stories are done. If you want to read, if you want to know more stories, you need to learn to read because in books you'll find them. And so I did, I, I bugged my mom to teach me how to read. And then I started delving into my dad's old pulp magazines and his comics and just like this love of storytelling and literature and genre all kind of like blossomed at the same time when I was young. I didn't come to like more literary stuff like poetry till I was in junior high and high school. Um, it was always like a more pulpy, like earthier, more rooted in, um, in the scary stories of my own family's traditions that led me to storytelling. So, um, you know, given that, you know, what do you feel like y'all have learned about the way like your cultures pass down stories? Is there any, you know, particular lessons or anything that you feel like is um, just so critical or essential to that? David, you're welcome to continue if, if you have an answer. Well, yeah, I mean, so um, I've thought about this a lot and you know, I have a, a collection called Border Lore, which is retellings of these stories. Um, and in the introduction to it, I talk about how every, the storytelling is about performance and every performance is about the intersection of the storyteller's um, own interests and character and so forth and the audience's interests and character. and where those two things come together, like this new version of the story emerges that can only exist at the moment of performance. And it's one of the reasons that sometimes I feel a little, I feel like sometimes I cheapen the stories by writing them down and there's no gaining around it. Like in today's times to preserve the stories, I need to write them down, but they are, as um, Darcy has pointed out, these are these are oral stories mm -hmm. that, that um, arguably maybe shouldn't even be written down, but the way the world is moving means that that would that would end in the erasure of so many of these stories and so to keep them alive sometimes we we have to preserve them in ways that that paradoxically kind of violate the the nature of the stories but yeah um because i am a writer an english major a, you know professor of english when i retell the stories that my grandmother told me i use those tools tools of you know the Western canon of literature and also like that too, as a lens through which to tell the stories and it changes them. Um, there's something essential I think that's preserved, but my performance of them is different than, than my grandmother Gat says, or my great grandmother Okay Nueva, or going back, you know, generations to, to the, our indigenous ancestors from which these stories arose originally. Darcy? Yeah, no, I was just thinking that? about that. And this is, this is kind of related, but I was thinking of the, the stories that I enjoy the most and that tend to influence my written work the most. And one thing about, you know, Native American stories is there tends to be this stereotype that they're all these very serious, like spiritual things. But in fact, there's stories of all, all sorts of natures. We, we have comedies, we have great adventures. Um, so those are the stories that I, that I focus on really. Um, it's, it's just, I, I don't see a lot of diversity often in the mainstream discourse about the nature of what our stories actually are. Um, so there, there are things like a, maybe our, our creation story. Like I, I wouldn't necessarily write that down in, in a young adult fantasy novel because you know, it's not fantasy, but I would be influenced by these really hilarious coyote stories that we tell. They, they just seem to be like over time, people would just riff off of them. So Coyote is many things to many people to us. I mean, he's naughty, but he's also kind of funny. 
and occasionally he's he's a little bit maybe heroic not quite but he's not the most terrible guy out there so he would get into these really wacky kind of situations sometimes he'd do good sometimes he'd basically a backfire on him so that's the kind of story that i that i really that type of storytelling that really influences me personally when it comes to writing fantasies <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree with both. I mean, I, th I think there's some, something really interesting about the the attempt to like domesticate the oral tradition. I, I, I you know, I, for me, I was pulling from the the Thousand and One Nights. Um, as, these are it, Thousand and One Nights is another way of saying like it's like an umbrella term for all the story. Like, there's stories kind of weave in and out of them. Parents will tell a story and sort of it's almost a frame device, and that's something that I've always really um really loved about it um and the the narrator here sort of starts to see himself in because he sort of imagines he's standing in front of a the the sort of the, the dubious gaze of this of these like middle schoolers um it starts to for him portend the same thing of as the murderous gaze of the king who of course um Sherazad is telling the story to in the audience and so the the sort of stand in um in the narrator says it directly like the reader, you're the king, and puts puts that sort of murderous criticism of text, uh, the responsibility, the obligation of that onto the uh, onto the reader, onto the students. So a, a lot of it is that dynamic of um, t telling the story almost from the defensive position of uh, against not only criticism but disbelief. That's sort of how he sort of positions himself. I think some of that is just by virtue of, as I said. Um, nobody, nobody really believing it. The first line of the book is, uh, you know, all Persians are liars and lying is a sin. So you know, this is this is what the kids think, and so um, so yeah, it sort of pulls from from the Arabian Nights, pulls from that notion of the 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 fact that the stories are told and they're retold and they're packed, you know, they're 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 sort of sutured together in new and different ways. They're it's very sort of. Um, pulling from the image of uh, on the image of like of, of patchwork, um, which the kid sort of starts off by saying, uh, you know, a patchwork memory is the shame of all refugees, right? Like just having not having a linear story, that's that he sees as a shame. Um, not having a linear history, having these things be broken, um, and of course, then then I, I think uh, this is the part isn't explicitly said. I think one of the realizations of the book of the narrator is is the richness of that tapestry, the richness of the patchwork, and um, and the the certain the, the value he finds in these stories. They're iterated and not codified, right? He doesn't necessarily put the value in linearity and codification but rather in like iteration and and patchwork these are the kinds of things that end up being um su suddenly at least a mark of his identity but also a mark of value yeah that was like good. super mfa i should have i should have <laughs> just some poop jokes somebody's too. probably <laughs> recording it you can go back and write it out <laughs> <laughs> i see an article coming no, indeed geez, that's right no, no, hey, we're no. always looking for those uh, yeah, no, I think that whole idea of reinvention, right? Yeah, um, yeah. There's a really I, neat uh, concept, in, 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 to me anyway, that called the the Persian flaw, which is, uh, you know, a Persian rug uh, leaving, they, they don't, they always take one stitch out. Right. And the, the notion is that, you know, nothing is perfect before, before God. Uh, and so, uh, and that becomes a, a hook for him for, for, to to think about the the flawed and the patchwork is kind of you know which which you know, oral tradition gets uh, gets that that sort of the, the, again I'm I'm now I'm bloviating all stuff <laughs> absolutely not um so I was thinking about um, y'all are all very busy people like you occupy spaces in the publishing world and you know outside of children's fiction David you're a translator you're a professor as well as being a writer you're also a major force on social media Darcy. You work in comic space. You're also a geoscientist. I don't even know what that job is, but it's way too smart for me. Um, and then Daniel, you actually also publish. Um, you're a, a publisher of an imprint called Odd Dot, um, and which is where books they tell me if I'm wrong, but like they start as mechanicals and not manuscripts. 
Um, so what I'm curious about is like it, existing in all those different worlds, can y'all each talk a little bit about like how you, um, how you code switch and, and kind of move among all those spaces? One of the things um, that makes the question difficult to answer is that I almost see all these things as a, con a continuity, as a, like a continuum. Um, my work in and among the spaces is, is all of it um, centered on the borderland Mexican-American identity. And from there, like everything else is about um, you know, the roots of that in, in Mexico and Mexico's roots in Mesoamerica, like going down and then going out, the um, trying to fight against the underrepresentation of the voices of my community in the publishing world and in schools and so forth, and uh, trying to prepare teachers who are working with Mexican American kids in the borderlands to center those students' identity and use text that reflect them and not just serve as mirrors, but serve as authentic authentic own voices mirrors books by other Latinx people, other Mexican Americans, rather than people writing about Mexican Americans. And so I feel like all of my work kind of um, gyrates around this like central um, axis and it makes it relatively easy for me to move back and forth because every single element of my professional identity informs every other single element. And it's just all moving together, spiraling, hopefully not out of control, but spiraling <laughs> somewhere <laughs> toward greater visibility, I hope, for me and my community. Um, but, it, you know, it, it does mean, because there are different audiences for these different works, that sometimes things can get a little complicated. My activism tends to be kind of strident, and sometimes I'm... I don't hold back and I will use profanity that I certainly wouldn't use, like, I don't know, at a school author visit or something like that. So, um, you know, I have to be careful tonally uh, to always be thinking about the audience of the particular moment, but um, I just see all of that as part and parcel, um, the one part with the rest of it, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I have to say, um a couple of elements, because I, I am a scientist. I have a PhD in oceanography. Basically what I did was I assembled the transcriptomes of some toxin producing phytoplankton species. That's basically like, if you think genome, these are the genes that are being expressed at any given time. These are the transcripts. Um, so I have a background, strong background in the ocean. I did get a geoscience degree as an undergraduate. So I know a lot about earth. And I currently am a scientific editor, which means I, I read like, um, 20 to 40,000 words of science every week. Um, but what this does is I've, I've noticed that although I'm not one of those writers who wants everything to be 100% scientifically accurate, especially in sci-fi and fantasy, I do sometimes find myself being influenced by the things I know. Uh, for example, I recently just submitted the edits to three dystopian uh, short stories and they deal with water issues um, things that I'm concerned about as an earth scientist and I see potentially very seriously affecting us in the future. Um, so I found that my science background has been a benefit to my, my creative background. And in terms of comics and, and um, being a like a novelist, they, they are two very different ways of writing. Um, and that's actually something that I, I, I'm doing some panels on later this month. Um, it's just how you write scripts for comics. But again, as growing up, I actually did both simultaneously. Um, I did get into comics professionally a little later than I did into writing fiction. But just having this experience, uh, you know, 30 years of, of writing like this has kind of helped it be easy for me to jump from different styles of writing. Uh, so that's my, my uh, brief answer. <laughs> that's super cool. <laughs> I wish yeah, no I, I, uh, yeah, I have a million questions for you, Darcy. Um, yeah, I, I feel like in publishing, I'm, 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 I'm really lucky. I'm, I, I have one of the cool, cooler jobs as far as I'm concerned, and maybe people don't feel that way. I, I really love it. Um, I'm, I'm the publisher of an imprint. The imprint is uh, Odd Dot, the, uh, um, and our mandate is, we call it Joyful Books for Curious Minds, um, are sort of off the... Um, off the books mandate is cool ass shit ain't nobody seen before. Um, 
And, and by that, we mean uh, really skill building books, really nonfiction, skill building um, in a completely new way. Um, and I get to sit down with about nine designers every day uh, and come up with new formats, new, new content, new, or new um, angles at teaching uh, different topics. And that teaching can be, um, you know, slime recipes, but it can also be uh, coding. Um, we just did a book, it's about 350 pages. It's by one of the, um, you know, uh, one of the preeminent sort of computer science, she, she helped develop the national curriculum for computer science. And it's this big book. And the beautiful part about it is it stand, the book itself stands up. We developed this format that like has the book, have sort of an easel inside the book. Um, and we, yeah, we come at things um, from a slightly different angle. The way it informs my creativity is I get to collaborate with a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of artists. I get to, I'm, I'm sorry, I, in publishing, um, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not exactly the most common uh, type. So I, I jokingly, I say I'm, uh, I feel like the a junkyard dog at the Westminster show, which is to say, <laughs> unwelcome, uh, but, but nobody can really tell it to leave. Uh, so, so that, that sort of, uh, that sort of position allows me to, to meet a lot of the other uh, oddities of the industry and that's why we called it odd dot um like odd ducks is kind of um the idea and so yeah so i get to i get to collaborate with a lot of artists on the on the every day um get to get to put different sorts of projects out there um but yeah i fundamentally um my writing is sort of a i keep i keep pretty separate and so i wake up in the morning and i write and um that that i tend to sort of keep for myself so to speak um but yeah thanks um well so daniel while while you're thinking about your writing um i was thinking about everything uh, sad is untrue and it was so incredibly just poignant and i think it's such an important contribution to literature for young people and beyond really i think it's a story for everyone um i'm curious since it's obviously you know autobiographical was it difficult to go back into those memories and those early childhood experiences as an immigrant and um, so I'm curious about that. I'm also wondering, um, you know, in your opinion, or um, why do you think it's so important to, to share um, those types of stories, those experiences? Uh, was it difficult? Yeah, it was, it, was, it was extremely difficult. Uh, I don't, um, I'm glad I never have to do it again. Um, it's something I, I worked on for about, um, about 13 years uh, and uh, I've written <laughs> a lot in between and um, yeah and, and I was trying very hard to be very honest um, while also being age appropriate and being um, not just age appropriate but like emotionally appropriate like right. you don't you know they're they're uh, trying to sort of meet the reader where they are um, so, you know I'm not trying to sort of shock them with what was, uh, you know, what was a non um, simple sort of scenario. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was quite difficult. It was, I actually, um, when I finally realized I was gonna write it for kids, I sort of decided to put it into, put the narrator um, at, the, at the age I had him at, um, doing what I was obsessed with, which was um, counting the memories like I very early on my grandfather uh, everyone was in Iran we, we were the only ones um, who le I'm sorry some were in Europe but we were fundamentally the three of us were the only ones suddenly uh, that we had and so right around um, right around the time I realized what the severity of a fatwa is that like no 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 you're in hiding like you can't go back though you're that there's there's um, it's sort of a life and death situation um, it dawned on me that I would never really see my grandfather again or my grandmother again. And, um, and then it sort of dawned on me that I was like, oh, there's a finite number of memories that I have, then they will never be added to, not with the mundane, not with anything. There's, it's just not gonna happen. And, um, and so I, as a kid, I started to like write things down a lot. Um, and and it became, the obsession went everywhere. Like I would write down, in like your mama jokes that I would hear, I would hear in like the schoolyard. I would just be like, "Well, I shouldn't remember. Forget these. These are really good. This is like wit." <laughs> and then I would like write down. I, I had like these notebooks that were really odd agglomerations of just like holding, um, and they were that hoarder's mentality. So, um, having going through those and counting the memories, um, sort of being shocked by how few of them I actually had, 
um, was was saddening. Um, and of course, it's my entire relationship with my father is there. He's still alive. He's in Iran. Um, you know, uh, and so that was tough. Um, why do I think it's important? Um, that's tough. Uh, I don't. I don't know. To some extent, my existence is not particularly justified. But to the extent that it is, um, I don't see why it wouldn't be any less or more than anyone else's. Uh, so I guess. I guess I. I have trouble sort of making it any more important than it is, or maybe any less important. Um, but it is a story that that hopefully sort of presents. I think for for kids for for you know whoever doesn't know it um, the the richness of a place that uh, often gets a pretty bad rap uh, yeah. not a lot of not if this becomes a movie not a lot of actors out there <laughs> so to go for well I mean I guess I could get uh, Jake Gyllenhaal to be a Persian again but um, <laughs> but I'll take it I'll take it as a compliment. <laughs> Uh, no, but the idea being, my point is simply that, you know, Middle Eastern men, especially not that they're, you know, they're, I wouldn't put them at the, uh, you know, having had the hardest time or anything like that, but um, there's very much a, um, a belief that these are, I mean, we, when we see them on TV, they're cutting somebody's head off. Yeah. Um, and, and it would be nice to, to, you know, my, our pain is any, no, no less real than someone else's. Um, and at the same time, in terms of curriculum, like, you know, I, I, our mythologies, our, our stories are, you know, there's a, there's a, you know, uh, Shirina Farhad is like our Romeo and Juliet. Rostam is like our Hercules, right? And even like defining them against that to me is like, I don't do it that way, but it's, it's certainly an, in, uh, uh, of interest, I would think to, to say that these stories, these stories are universal, or at the very least, these stories, um, you know, exist in other cultures and trying to present it that way. But I have trouble with that one. I have trouble with why I, you know, fundamentally, why, um, why it might be important. Um, but thank you for the question. Well, I think Jake would be lucky to, uh, uh, to, to get to be you. <laughs> Not that he should do it, Jake, but he'd, oh, we'll he'd be very lucky. Well, yeah, <laughs> um, so Darcy, I'm going to go back to you for a moment. Um, I'm still blown away. I'm thinking about the oceans. and yeah. <laughs> Anyway, my, my dissertation looked a little different <laughs> than that. Um, so you're obviously an indigenous identified writer and your story takes place in a version of Texas. That's not quite like the Texas that, you know, I live in and that uh, many of us have some roots in. So what inspired you to, to explore, you know, this alternate America? Um, it, your, your book also crosses many genres. You know, it's a murder mystery. It's got paranormal elements. It's got horror. It, it's got historical fiction. So um, <laughs> you talk about what inspired that. You're like, kitchen sink. Let me get a little yeah. bit of everything and actually turn it into something quite brilliant. So to, Oh, thank you. <laughs> you're very welcome. It's true. <laughs> um, so it, I, I usually start with the first inspiration of this story was I was just thinking, this was years ago, how cool it would be if you could train a ghost dog or a ghost woolly mammoth how to do supernatural tricks. <laughs> so basically everything bloomed from that concept. So I, I, I envisioned this young protagonist, Ellie, and she has this knowledge how to wake dead animals, not dead humans because human ghosts are terrible things as you learn in the book. Um, and I wondered how would that affect our world as we know it? And then I also threw in some other types of magic. Um, I am, my father is Irish American. Uh, my mom's Apache. So I do have, I, I'm biracial, I have different backgrounds, uh, elements coming in. Of course I threw vampires in there because there's so many vampires <laughs> everywhere. I thought it'd be fun to do my own take on that. Um, and in terms of the mystery to tie it all together, that's just my fondness for mysteries. I mean, I, I absolutely, the, the two things I, I watch consistently on TV are horror and mysteries. Um, so I somehow I, I thought of a really cohesive plot that combined all these elements. I did think it was important though to, because something I, I was, I read constantly growing up. And I never in my life, like never saw lip on protagonist. And so I did think it was important to kind of emphasize what it's like to be a lip on teen in contemporary days, not in the past, because the Apaches didn't all die in the 1800s. <laughs> um, so that's one reason I want it to be contemporary type uh, fantasy, um, but also this kind of clash between our stories, our monsters, our knowledge, and 
the the monsters and the knowledge and the stories that have been brought in um, since the colonization of the Americas started. Uh, so that that's really how Latsaway came together. Um, and of course, I, I kind of one thing that I don't know if I've talked much about is Latsaway is the name of my grandmother. Um, so uh, a very prominent theme in this story is just the strength of these generations of women that pass down the knowledge to the protagonist. Um, so that was another element that I thought was important to include in my book. That and just the, the support of family. Because uh, I don't know if you noticed, but uh, in the rare instance that, that there is native fiction, um, oftentimes family is portrayed, in, and I mean, everyone's experience is different, but it's very rare to find a positive portrayal of Native families. Of course, it's very rare to find any portrayal of Native families, but um, I wanted to include that element in my book as well. Yeah, I love that. And yeah, you're right, because then so often, especially mm -hmm. in stories of people of color or Native mm -hmm. stories, there aren't many, number one. And then there's a lot of, you know, what I like to think of like mm -hmm. grief porn. It's, it's always yeah. taken to the darkest and there's very little opportunity to to share the joy and just the normalness of all kinds of families. Yeah, and, and that's, definitely. kids need to see that. <laughs> like, you know, they just really, really do. And I um, like, personally, there's been a lot of very tragic things that have happened in that side of my family and in, in my own life. But also I've had so many instances of joy and so many of those have been derived from just being with my family. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> So David, I haven't forgotten about you. <laughs> um, so you are like such a prolific writer. I'm looking at the shelf behind you. Look at all those amazing books. You've just done a lot. And you know, you're, you really appeal from your writing and your work goes from, you know, books for, for littles um, all the way to adults. So, um, you know, I want to talk obviously about Sea Ring World and I'm particularly interested in your translation work um, in regard, especially to how they relate to borders. Um, so sometimes you translate Spanish books from Latin America into Americanized Spanish. And that's the case, you know, with Sea Ring World. Um, as you mentioned earlier, the writer is a Mexican writer, but you translated it. And you spoke about this a little bit as we were starting, but I wanted to um, ask you a bit more to me, that seems like a huge responsibility. Um, so what I'm curious about is, you know, what are the biggest challenges to doing that kind of work? And as a prolific writer of original work, you know, how is that focus different than um, writing um, your own stories as opposed to um, the work that you do for translations? Right, right. So let, let's talk about three different translation scenarios to kind of to kind of like walk you through what it feels like. So. Um, I recently translated my own book, They Call Me Bueno, um, into um, Spanish um, for uh, Vintage Espanol. Um, and there, because it's my work and I'm translating it, I get to, I, I can literally just, essentially what I do is recreate some of those poems rather than translating them. I know what I intended. I know the voice of the character. I know the way he speaks Spanish just as well as I know the way he speaks English. And so... I have complete liberty to, to do what needs to be done. When I'm translating um, from, when I'm translating somebody else's work, their original work from Spanish into English, like I recently did with um, Jose, Jose Luis Zarate's novella um, that's gonna be coming out from a different press uh, next year. There, um, I have a responsibility to that author and the specific things that they were accomplishing in Spanish with their voice, their talent, their ideas, and transmitting that as best I can. But while I'm doing that, it's inevitable that it's going to be filtered through my sensibilities as a writer. You see, uh, there's no way of getting around that. So um, it's hard to be a translator and, and not simultaneously be a writer of the English version. You are writing this thing into existence in a new language. And this, this, it's a heavy responsibility as well when I'm translating from like classical novel to um, things that the, the children and grandchildren of the Aztecs uh, in Tenochtitlan and so forth that were conquered by Cortes wrote down in the aftermath of the conquest, bringing that into English, you know, there's obviously like a huge responsibility to, to get that right and get those voices right the way it makes sense that they would resonate in English. Um, so that there the responsibility becomes even 
like larger and the, the work that you do. Some people imagine that translation is about you being transparent. You're just taking the words and rendering them in English as clear as you can, but there's no such thing. Like in reality, translation doesn't exist. There's no way to actually just make transparently clear in a new language what was said in the other language. There are just too many cultural references and um, ways of expressing things in, in the original language that don't exist in the target language. In the case of Maria Garcia Peron's book, things get even more complicated because Maria has taken the stories of people outside of her own culture, in addition to, to stories from Mexico that are tangentially related to her, um, her ancestry as a, you know, a mestiza mexicana who inherits you know, stuff from Aztecs and, and Maya and so forth. But it, she's taken stories from other cultures, often retold by anthropologists and so forth, and then rendered them in a, in a Spanish accessible to kids. And what I have to do now, and this we had great conversations with Nick Thomas, my editor there at Living Querido. What I have to do is not just translate her words into English in the respectful way that I would do with somebody else. I have to also look beyond Maria at the traditions that she's pulling from. So that meant for every single one of the stories going back to the original sources and digging even deeper and trying to find alternate versions um, written down by native storytellers, if I could find them, trying to find, you know, trying to dig deep and find the roots of these stories so that bringing them to an English audience, I could fold even more of those native voices into the text. Um, because, and, and here, here are some even further complicating things. Publishing in Mexico has a very different view of the retelling of sacred stories than publishing in the United States does. And then Levine Querido has an even like more, um, it has an even stronger desire, I think, than a lot of publishers to get that right and to not hurt anybody and not to erase any voices. And so we had a slew of uh, cultural expert readers uh, from multiple cultures read through the manuscripts who was working on it and made adjustments. And the responsibility is so huge and at the end, all you can do is hope that you got it close to being right. That I don't, I, I mean, I, I like the thing that Daniel said earlier about the flaw and everything. And this book, like every book, is going to be flawed in some way. And there's going to be somebody that reads it and reads the story of their people and feels like that story wasn't told the way it should have been told. But given the audience that we're shooting for, and given the negative attitudes toward um, indigenous people in this, and this view of them as having, as Darcy talked about, having died out long ago, you know, the Maya, back when the Maya existed, there are like 5 million Maya people living in, in Central America and South uh, Mexico, for example. Um, getting that right and getting a book like this into the hands of English speaking children who need to know that, that these stories are vibrant and real and mattered in the past and matter now. And, um, that kind of responsibility. There are some people that might just say, no, forget it. I can't take that responsibility on because it also means taking on the responsibility if you get it wrong and being the person to say it, it when the complaints come um, to be, to say, yeah, you know what? Um, you're right. I didn't do that as well as I could have. And, and I'm sorry for that. So um, that's what a translator has to be ready to do. A translator has to be humble and do their best to be a conduit for the voice and also be willing to take the hit if they don't quite get it right. And it, it's a tricky thing being a translator, but I also love it because it's also very, it's magical. And when, when you get close to being right, you can make things come alive for people that they wouldn't have access to otherwise. That's such a good point. Um, so in looking at the time, we're, we, um, we're, we still have a little bit, and I have one final question for you before we um, uh, transition to some questions. We've fielded some really good questions from um, our viewers. So the last thing I want to ask each of you, I want to shift, since this is an EDU session, I want to shift the conversation directly back to education and instruction. And, you know, specifically thinking about traditional schools here in the United States, you know, by and large, um, education is still a profession that is predominantly white. Um, just like me. And I think that um, I would like to ask each of you for a final thought about why you think it's so important that educators share um, you know, stories like yours. 
Um, so if, if any of y'all want to jump in and tell us that um, or answer my question, I would appreciate it. Yeah, I gotta say, it'd be doing those those kids a disservice if you did it. <laughs> and also, um, one thing that I'm aware of too is that oftentimes when non-white stories are excluded from the conversation, there's a lot of children who don't see themselves reflected in the curriculum. So that's why it's important as well. David, do you want to share anything else? Well, yeah, I mean, I think um, I, I, research shows us again and again that it's not only children from communities of color that need to have, um, you know, greater exposure to inclusive literature and stories uh, uh, about them, stories that center some identities other than white identity, but white children also really, really benefit from this. They, um, th it builds up empathy. Um, it helps them to, to decenter a kind of hegemonic way of thinking about identity and culture. Um, it, it, uh, it, it just fosters plurality and, and a, a lot of democratic values that I think that we give lip service to in, in the United States, but we, that we seldom actually live by. Um, and so I think it is really incumbent on teachers to bring in this literature, not just to, to lift up the children of color and the native children, the black children in their classrooms, but also to um, provide a broader spectrum of human experience to the white children in their classroom. Agreed, Daniel? Yeah, I agree. They nailed it. They both nailed it. Uh, I, don't, I don't. I think. Uh, I, I agree. Um, I also. I also think. I think. I think it's. It's true across a lot of vectors. It's true um, across everything said, and it's also. It's also true that I think um, along the best work, they, every, any student should and will see uh, that sort of shared, you know, the the commonality, the shared humanity in these. Uh, in these works. So, um, you know, there's a part of me that well, really wants to answer your question in a way that will make me come off as really bad, right? Because like a part of me, I was raised, you know, my father was in Iran. The man who most sort of affected my life was a football coach in Edmond, Oklahoma. And his answer would have been, if you got better, go with it. <laughs> um, it's in the sense of like, I, I, I think these works are, they compete in the marketplace of ideas with every work. And um, and are not only valuable and help uh, broaden um, the 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 experience of every of every reader, but are also um, wonderful works of art. That's not you know I think I think that's that wouldn't be my first reason, but um, I think David and Darcy gave my first and second. That would be my third. Is you know hey um, you know this is this it's is good the, shit. <laughs> that was it. That's it. I I, I concur. We're being we're being we're being way too nice. It's just badass, guys. It's badass. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you know, I I that that I don't want to be graded on a curve. That's for sure. I want to, yeah. but, but it's but it, I promise. Um, you know, I think I think the the goal of of all great stories are to are to um, sh share the strange and the sublime and also bring in and as as David said as well and Darcy um to to build empathy of of completely the strange um and maybe the other in 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 ways that um are happening at the same time so it's hard to push one over the other but um I agree totally well one of the questions that we um that we got from um a viewer was if you would each um, share your book title again, and that's a great idea. So we've been talking about these fantastic books. So David, I'll let you go first if you'll share. And um... Yeah, it's called The Sea Ringed World, Sacred Stories of the Americas. So like sea ringed, like, like ringed by seas, S-E-A dash ringed, sea ringed. Mine's uh, Everything Sad is Untrue, uh, A True Story. And mine's let's away. Oh, can you see it reverse? <laughs> no, no, it comes across normal, yeah. Oh, good, good. good. <laughs> and one thing I really, I just have to point this out, Rubina Kai, 
uh, did the cover, but she also illustrated every chapter of the book. Oh, so I'm just beautiful. really, I'm so, I'm so excited that I had the chance to work with her. She's brilliant. <laughs> That's, That's phenomenal. Good stuff. Okay, so um, a question that um, I think is a, a, another good one is, what obstacles to storytelling have you had to overcome and what practices should educators adopt or avoid to, um, to cultivate um, their students' storytelling abilities? Well, just the sense that, um, that I have to tell stories the way stories are being told to me, like, um, like that there's some kind of framework or you know whatever. So one of the things that you see a lot with younger kids, well, I mean, I haven't taught middle school kids in a while, but when I was teaching them, Harry Potter was really popular. And so every kid who wanted to write a story <laughs> felt like they had to write like some version of Harry Potter and, and like give, uh, letting, giving yourself permission to structure stories and use voices other than what is the norm in publishing, um, other than what's the norm around you, I think that's really important. Yeah, I have to say, I, I'm, I feel very lucky that Alatsue is being published by Levine Credo um, because my editor, Nick, and just everyone there is very understanding of the diversity of ways to tell stories. Um, that's especially true with a, a new book I'm, I'm working on that I, I can't talk much about, but I'm actually basing it on more of our traditional way of storytelling, not this three act structure, you know, not, not the stuff that, that you learn in school as these basic rules to how to write a book. Um, another thing that I've had to overcome, I think, and this is more the case with my short stories where I'm writing a lot, I'm submitting a lot, you know, you receive a lot of rejections, that's natural. Sometimes those rejections feel that something isn't authentic <laughs> when you're writing from a place of authenticity. And that's just because there, there are these stereotypes that are, um, they're, they're still in our society. They, they still affect the way that a, a native writer writing native characters may be viewed. Uh, but fortunately, I, I've met a lot of great editors who are like, hey, we like this fantasy book about an Apache character that doesn't play into stereotypes or, you know, um, but that, that, that's one difficulty. <laughs> Uh, yeah, for me, I, I had a teacher who was really, um, she was wonderful and wanted to hear the sort of the, the mundane, the, what I, you know, I think kids are very self-critical. I think, um, I think, I think teachers uh, are set in play such a particular role in, in, in both helping them, you know, it's so interesting. They, they, the paradox of helping them understand that they're not nearly as important as they might think they are, <laughs> but they're not nearly as uninteresting as they, they fear they are. Um, and so that, that push and pull, that's what makes that mastery. And uh, I guess I'm not a teacher that, but that it seems to me like that, that might be an aspect of the masters of how they do it um, so well is helping them to be humble in the sense of not believing, you know, not believing more of themselves, but like literally thinking of themselves less, you know, not thinking less of themselves. In that sense, um, I had the teachers who were who were really good about asking, you know, asking about my memories, asking about my stories, and like like quote unquote memoirs. It's laughable, um, and this is part of the joke in some ways of having a twelve year old write a memoir. Um, but but it's not also not that that is their task. Their task is to relate what they see in this world and having them write memoirs, getting past that initial joke. Like yes, we understand that they are not whoever, <laughs> Shackleton, uh, and, you know, but whatever. But uh, they have something very particular and precocious and precious about um, writing in one page a particular memory, however mundane. I, I love that. I love asking them to tell me, you know, one thing, slowly deliver it, give it to me. And I promise I'll be interested, uh, you know, and that, that to me is always... Um, well, that, that certainly was something that made a difference in my life for the teacher. I, I can't really speak with any authority about what teachers should do. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, okay, I think this is going to be our final question. And thank you so much to all of the, uh, those of you that have submitted questions. Um, this one um, is from Anonymous, but thank you, Anonymous. Um, Anonymous wants to know, Will the next generations lose their ability to storytell because of technology or will technology enhance their ability to share their family stories? 
What do you think, guys? Um, technology will never stop anybody from telling stories. Technology hasn't up to this point. It, um, it, it may subvert the way stories are told. It may mean that you tell them in ways that are different from the way your ancestors told them. But there will always be storytelling. And th this, this nervousness about technology has cropped up again and again as time has progressed. There was a nervous, nervousness about printing books. There was a nervousness mm -hmm. about printing them um, it, it, it massively. There was a nervousness about radio, about TV. There's been a nervousness about every single thing that's come along. And none of those have stopped people from orally telling stories the way they've been told for hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and um, I just think that we layer new and, and, um, and more interesting ways of doing that work that then begin to filter down all the way to the oral storytelling and enrich in that and, and make it um, even more precious than it was before. So, no, I, I, I suspect that that will not happen. Yeah, I have to say a, a couple answers. One is technology has been great for me. I, I have a dystonia. It affects the, I, I can't really use my hands for fine motor movements. It's very difficult to write by hand. <laughs> um, so just these voice to text slash even just using a keyboard has been great. But also I love what the internet, they have these pockets of storytellers. Like, are you aware of what creepy pasta is? Yeah. They're like these short little scary <laughs> stories. Them. Yes, and they spread on the internet. They've been around for years. And I, I, I notice a lot of young writers mm -hmm. are the ones who are the driving force of creepypasta. So there are these communities of storytellers building off of each other. And I, I just found it just so charming. <laughs> I agree. I think I think we're we're finding more and new and interesting tools with which to tell stories. Um, but yeah, we're storytelling animals. That's not going away. Um, in fact, I, I I dare say it's uh, enhancing. That doesn't mean I think um, I don't know what that does. I don't even know what I'm mitigating against. I think I think we're um, you know great work is coming out in in all forms, um, and it's that part that part's really exciting. Um, I can't wait to see what the next generation of kids going. That, that generation of kids, like the digital, whatever we want to call them, I, I guess they seem they seem pretty cool, and they seem, uh, you know, really really fascinated by a, you know a whole variety of things. I I'm I'm jazzed uh, to see how they present. Also, I'm I'm really excited to see how they will tell their stories in retrospect. You know, like. How do they, that's all neat stuff. But yeah, they, my, my predecessors said the right answers. I think. Um, I think we'll have a lot of pandemic stories <laughs> and they'll all get to the point <laughs> like, yeah, right? Everybody, <laughs> that'll be a piece of their story for sure. <laughs> and I should, I'm sure there's also a lot of um, sharing of ancestral family stories right now as people yeah. are cloistered in with each other. Um, Extremely. For yeah. sure, yeah. yeah. So cool. um, that's a real opportunity. Well, um, we are out of time. So I want to thank you. Um, those of you that submitted questions, thank you for your great questions and special thanks to Darcy and Daniel and David for being with us for this thoughtful and engaging conversation. Uh, Julia, back to you. Thank you so much, Rose. And thank you all for uh, tuning into today's South by Southwest EDU online session. And we hope to see you on Thursday.